Hey guys, I'm Justin with Legato Financial Group. Our firm is passionate about helping educate consumers, which is why we're powering the Gaining Interest Podcast. The podcast of quick conversations with industry experts on topics that you want to know about, from sports to dining to healthcare and automotive, and really everything in between. It's hosted by one of the greatest local personalities that I've met, that's John Ramsey. I'll tell you why I love this podcast, because it's all about community. We used to call it water cooler talk, and that no longer exists. But if it's interesting to you, it's interesting to us. We encourage you to tell your friends. As Justin mentioned, we're gonna talk about everything under the sun. We will be gaining interest, and we appreciate you watching. Hello everyone and welcome once again to Gaining Interest, which is powered by, sponsored by Legato Financial Group. You know, when you try to bring a business or an individual into a city, you talk about maybe tourist attractions, the restaurant scene, lifestyle in general, but you rarely talk about an individual who brings value to the city. This man does that. His name is Steve Wilson. He's quite the Renaissance man and we're going to talk about that today. Steve, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay. I said Renaissance man. And sometimes people just throw that word around, but you're, you've been in politics, mm -hmm. you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're a lover and owner of a lot of fine art. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had a lot of successful ventures and you love a good party. Is Renaissance man a good description? I think it works pretty good in today's time. I'm a farmer too, don't forget that. That's right, I didn't throw that in. <laughs> I mean, that's a, you've got a lot on your plate, so much to talk about. I think the way to start this is, I was having lunch, it happened yesterday. I was having lunch with former mayor, Greg Fisher, and he said, every town needs a Steve Wilson, because I was telling him I'm gonna oh. interview you. He said, every town needs a Steve Wilson. Wilson. He's a creative thinker, looks outside the box, and he's willing to pursue some of his visions. And I thought, wow, I like telling that. It's a nice compliment. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with the city. Uh, as you said, I've been involved in politics since I got out of college in the 70s. and. Um, I worked for several governors. I worked for John Y. Brown, Walt Wilkinson, D. Huddleston when he was a senator. So I've always, my father was a mayor for 18 years of Wycliffe, a little town in West Kentucky. So I got that interest in politics, I think, early. Although dad's salary was so small, he donated it to the Methodist Church every year. I don't even know what it was, but um, he didn't do it for the money, obviously. So anyway, be, uh, being involved, I like to make a difference, and I felt when I got out of school, I, I went to Thailand on an exchange program, and when I got back, I really wanted to do something with my life that I could feel good about contributing. I feel like we all <clears throat> need to do that. So I got involved in politics. After I left that, I came to Louisville, and, and I, knew, uh, I knew Jerry Abramson from, you know, Jerry was uh, legal counsel for the governor's office when I was over there. So I knew Jerry and I knew Armstrong. I knew- uh, Well connected. Yeah, so I guess you could say. Anyway, so that's my connection there. And I've always, you know, Craig Greenberg, our current mayor is my best friend really. So I've enjoyed being on the edge of leadership um, and doing what we can for the city of Louisville. When, uh... I, think, I think what is interesting about you, Steve, is, and we talked a little bit about this prior to the interview, but what's interesting is there are people who are very extreme in their business savvy. They're very smart and intellectual and about how to make things happen going from A to B. There are people who are very creative and very artistic and are visionaries. Rarely do you have someone who is very adept and, and good at both, and you are that. But I do think that if someone was to mention your name in this town, say Steve Wilson, you're you're kind of synonymous with art and fine art. Right. So if you would talk a little bit about your love, your passion and affinity for art and where that began. Okay, well, let me first say that I appreciate all your compliments, but it takes a team to accomplish all these things that we've done. And uh, I am a creative, I'm an, I think outside of the box. I'm a risk taker. I think that's essential for mm -hmm. You have to be willing to fail to be successful, I think. And certainly we've had our failures. <clears throat> but um, art, I was, I was an art student at Murray State. And um, in my drawing class, the professor came by and ripped my drawing off and said, you don't belong here. 
So, <laughs> so then I went to political science. Okay, I'm not going to be an artist. So, but so I've always had that interest in art, and I've always been creative. So then, uh, when Laura Lee Brown and I met, we we shared a mutual interest in art and we and in travel, and in community activities. So that sort of brought us together. So our mutual interest in art has been something that we've really enjoyed. I, th I find it interesting that you put your money where your mouth is in that you believe in the renovation of architecture, you believe in fine art, you create this thing that everyone knows has been a huge success now, it's 21C. But in the beginning, the 21C Museum Hotels, they were scoffed at. A lot of businessmen in town said, oh, that'll never happen. <laughs> uh, but you believed in it, and yeah. now it's a huge success. Talk about the beginnings and what your vision was and the involvement to what it became. Okay, well, that... <clears throat> In, you're right. In the beginning, uh, no one thought it would work. Contemporary art in Louisville, Kentucky, especially the bankers. <laughs> so <clears throat> we cobbled together five, five empty buildings. Corner of 7th and Main was not a very active location, and we wanted to help the economy of the city. We, our collection was growing, uh, and we were looking for a way to share the art in a public way and also do something significant. So we did a, we traveled a lot and we've seen how the Europeans live with art more than we do really. I mean, the idea of having to go to a museum to see art mm -hmm. is sort of an old fashioned idea, I think, in, in my view. Um, and at home we live with art in every room of the house and we change it around. There might be something leaning against the wall. So, uh, we decided to try to do an art hotel. I mean, we really had never seen one exactly like we did it, but we took pieces of things that we'd seen in Basel, Switzerland, or Venice, Italy, and and started sharing our art collection. Never dreaming there'd be more than one. That yeah. was and how many are there now, Steve? Eight. Eight 21C hotels. Mm -hmm. So to me, this speaks to not only the fact that yes, art enhances a community, and there's been many studies that show how children, and as far as brain growth and all of this, how art helps, but it also shows that economically, art helps a city, and you prove that with a concept, as you said, conservative bankers were going, nah, that'll never work, but you made Louisville evolve rather quickly, which I like, because before I think we were seen as a conservative town, mm -hmm. but thanks to people like you thinking outside the box, I think now people see us as a little bit more edgy. Uh, talk a little bit about the importance to art to, as a community and why you believed you could monetize that as well. Lorley and I had been to Bilbao, Spain, and I was really intrigued by the Guggenheim Museum there. <clears throat> Louisville and Bilbao are similar in that they're small river towns, and in Bilbao, they were losing their young people to Madrid or wherever, and there wasn't really there wasn't really something that made the young people proud of being in that city. But there was there's some great stories about <clears throat> the museum in Bilbao and but it 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 made it made something new and interesting for the community. And tourists started coming and it created new businesses, new restaurants, new hotels, a new train station, new taxis, and so it, it completely transformed that little town and made and gave them something to be proud of. Now Louisville is, I mean, we've got a lot to be proud sure. of here. Obviously the Derby and, and great sports teams and university that's outstanding, but <clears throat> uh, we just felt like there was a need for art in the daily life of the city. The Speed Museum is out at the University of Louisville so we wanted to do something downtown. And, you know, after that, <clears throat> uh, well, they, see, I think the Arts and Crafts Museum was across the street already. But a lot of things have happened downtown oh, yeah. since, since we started. That was 16 years ago. You know, you... Nobody thought it would work. Nobody afraid to go downtown. Yes. Or would you park? You know, it was a lot of naysaying. You seem to have a better understanding of how art brings people together and makes a community because, I mean, if you go to a concert, then you feel it, you, you, or you're at the gospel portion of a church session, you go, okay, I feel this. And 
looking at art, whether it be a sculpture, hearing art, whether it be a symphony or a rock show, whatever it happens to be, does bring community together. You seem to have a really good understanding of that, and you believed in it so much that you created 21C. And from what I understand, I bet your art collection is incredible. It, do, you, do you enjoy watching people just enjoy, <laughs> you know, just sit back and enjoy oh, and just, for sure. and they'll have different thoughts, right? Everybody's perception is different. Yes, right? exactly. I like, the, <clears throat> we like to provoke thought and pictures, paintings have always been, even back in the 12th, 13th century, when people, the great masters were painting, people were illiterate and the paintings were a way of communication. So your visual interpretations are really critical. And I think one of the reasons that I've been drawn to this <clears throat> is that I was raised in a really conservative Methodist household. And God love my mother and father. They wouldn't talk about anything controversial if, if it you had to, you know. My mother, <laughs> I remember mother left a brochure about masturbation on my bedside table. Never spoke about it. How did it get there? It was just like, this is something you might want to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we never talked about sex. We never talked about race relations, you know. So, I like some people are uncomfortable, for instance, talking about death. Uh, but if you put something on the wall, it may, you know, have you heard about my death clock? I've heard about your death clock, apparently, and, and please describe this. <laughs> apparently you have this clock that is literally counting down to the day you pass away. Right. T tell folks about this. Well, it's a sculpture. It's a digital sculpture created by an artist named Werner Reiter from Austria. And he created for whomever were to acquire this sculpture, and then that person turned out to be me, was to take an actuary test, which was a pretty significant questionnaire about, oh, health, medical health problems risk, in my family, yeah. or how do I drink, do I smoke, have sex, how often, do you drive, all these things. So it came up with, at the time it was 13 years and whatever. So it was a lot funnier when we hung it up. Now it says less than five years. So I don't even want to think but, that. We, we need you to stick around a lot no, longer, Nasty. I, you know, I don't really. Actually, it got in the restaurant because I had it over my door at the office. And some artists who redid the interior proof asked if they could put it in the private dining room. So that's why it's down there. But I take it as just a reminder that life is precious and every minute counts. And um, when I was going to to work in my office, passing under it every day, it was, let's get something done today, you know? It's, time is ticking away. There's some urgency so, here. Yeah. yeah. So I don't take it literally, but I've been saying lately that we're gonna plan a big party for the day it hits zero, so everybody can watch it. <laughs> I want an invite. Okay. <laughs> you worked into something I really wanted to talk about <laughs> on a much lighter note, folks. Uh, this is not about death, this is actually about living life to this to the fullest. Your parties are legendary. What you have done at Herman H. Farm at 21C for your 65th birthday. If you're not invited to these parties, you know, try your best to get an invite. So talk oh. about that flair. You, it's, it's a combination between a great dance party and Cirque du Soleil. And you always wanted to run away to the circus, right? Mm, that's, uh, actually, when I was a kid and got in trouble, which I did often with my dad, no. I would, um, I would get in my bed and pull the sheet over my head and pretend I was a ringmaster in a circus tent. And in my tent, everything would be beautiful, everybody would be happy, and there would be no crying in my tent. So You created that. I, you know, I, later in life I began to think about that. That was, you know, an omen. I, it wasn't that I went about life thinking someday I will have my circus tent, but uh, back in when I knew you in the John Y. Brown days, we were doing fundraisers events in a, in a tent, literally. So <laughs> it all came together. It all there's, came together. There's yeah. probably some therapy sessions in there somewhere <laughs> about so. your childhood, but that's okay. You, you've so. done very well for yourself. So I, whoever your therapist is, I want I want a card or a number. Okay. You, a lot of people would think when they go, okay, Steve Wilson, you look at all this beautiful art and the success of 21C and, and Hermitage Farms, bringing that back. I mean, it was going to be developed, and you said, look, I can do something better with this and where people can enjoy uh, all of the agriculture, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But they would think everything you touch is gold. 
Oh. And yet, and yes, I'm glad you said that. Yet, I have heard you at one time owned a restaurant in Frankfurt that did not do so well, no, which exactly. is hard to believe because I've seen everything you touch does turn to gold. So t tell us a little bit about some of your failures. Oh, well, that was, it was called the Bishop House. And at the time, my first wife was the sister of the governor, uh, Julian Carroll. I did not know that. So there was a lot of controversy about me getting a liquor license since the governor was my brother-in-law. And I had some strange ideas. I, I didn't know. I, I'd had success, as you say, planning events and uh, some pretty good press about those kind of things. I, so I thought I knew all about hospitality. But um, we opened that restaurant on Derby night, which, of course, I That's would bold. never do. Because you got to bring an A-plus oh, to Derby night. Yeah. You know, we, we have soft openings now. You know, we train the staff. We invite people who for free so they can't complain too much. And so, but we learn, you know, about how to deal with it through soft openings and building up. 20 people to 40 people to 50, you know. So anyway, we had no soft opening. And um, we, I had, there were several significant government guests, the Secretary of Federal Highway Department. So I flew in lobsters for this opening night. And um, the lobster were on the table and somebody asked for a lobster cracker. And the waitress went down to the kitchen, which is in the basement. She said, they want some lobster crackers. No, she said, they want some crackers. The chef said, oh, my God, I have, I made bread. We don't have crackers. Tell them we don't have it. They just wanted the crackers, tool yes. to get into the lobster. Oh, my God. And the goodness. waitress didn't even know what that know. was. Oh, my God, it was a disaster. Ooh. Okay, uh, now and, let's uh, talk about another success. Okay, <laughs> Hermitage Farms. Apparently, from what I understand, that property was going to be developed. Right. And it is a beautiful piece of property. And you've got, you know, Barn 8. And, you know, it, it is just, to me, it's very picturesque. It speaks to Kentucky, which you love. And, I'm, right. and, I, and I love that you and Laura Lee decided to develop that in your way. With that being said, so tell me about what was that decision like and what did you envision and what it is? Yeah. Uh, so when Hermitage came on the market to be subdivided, it really pulled on my wife's heartstrings because she had been raised at a farm called Sutherland, which as you know, now is a very large established subdivision. Um, but in, in her youth, that, there was only one house on that property. So, and then we live on Woodland Farm, which is out 42 and a little farther past Hermitage. So it was, it was really because the farms are being, you know, on the east side of Louisville and the up the river. It's beautiful countryside, and people like being there. And it's being eat up with subdivisions. So we thought this is one place that should remain green. Um, and Hermitage, you know, besides just being a horse farm, it won the Kentucky Derby in 1953 with a horse named Dark Star. I did not know that, all right. Who was the only horse who ever beat Northern Dancer, who was more famous than Dark Star sure. at the time. 50 to one odds, I think. Oof. And then later the Queen visit in the 80s. So it has, it's still a horse farm, um, but it has some great history. And we thought of trying to create what might be thought of as the iconic Kentucky destination. If you're a tourist coming to town, don't have a lot of time, certainly we've got some great bourbon tours, but this is a place where you can come see horses, drink some bourbon, have some great food, and uh, have got a taste of what Kentucky has always been about and what we want to continue. Um, some of your horses live better than I do, Steve. You take, you take good care of animals. Well, we do. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny to me that tourists, or say, say a tourist from New York City who loves bourbon, likely doesn't think about it as an agriculture farm product. They don't, somehow you buy it in a glass bottle, it, it comes from the land, right? right? The corn, the rye, the wheat, yes. So that's what we're trying to do at Hermitage, bring all that together and bring, it, bring that awareness and... Um, an appreciation for what Kentucky's all about.
Yeah. And for those who haven't experienced it, okay, so talk a bit about some of the amenities. There are tours, there's uh, Barn 8. Tell us a little bit about what they can see there if they okay. take well, a little time. Um, barn 8 is a restaurant in a real horse barn. Um, and I think uh, we talked about taking risks, but I think authenticity is also a really key to success. Um, and that there's nothing, it's truly a horse barn. The tables are in the stalls. There's evidence of the horse cribbing on the wood. Um, and the colors are as they would have been as a horse barn. So it's, uh, we made, the kitchen is an old dirt floor run-in shed and the bar is also on the edge of the barn. So it's been really successful. People like the atmosphere. It's kid-friendly, but really good food. Um, it's a beautiful experience. <clears throat> if you can, please experience that. So we uh, added a garden. Okay. <clears throat> there's a greenhouse and uh, a horticultural crew raises a lot of the things we serve in the greenhouse, in, in Barn 8. Not everything, but the greens, the carrots, and different things throughout the year. Authenticity. But there, yeah. It's important. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your love of farming and where that came from. I was raised on a farm, and I was a 4-H'er. Did all the projects, raising a pig, raising a steer, everything that 4-H kids do. And 4-H was important in my life. It got me that international trip to Thailand that we talked about briefly. So Laurelie and I were living at Woodland Farm at the time of the tobacco settlement. And there was federal money available. And the concept was to, to help farmers diversify, get away from tobacco and learn and do other things. So we thought, we, we thought that bison, because bison meat is more healthy, than beef and because bison was almost extinct and brought back from extinction by farmers and ranchers, uh, that we'd try bison. We had we started with 25 head and we thought that that might be something that other farmers could follow suit with. It turned out that not many did, but that was 25 years ago and we're still raising bison where we live. They're we, beautiful animals too. They are beautiful animals and they're very smart and uh, Agile as well. Agile, for sure. That's why, you know, every once in a while you hear about a tourist getting run over by a bison out at Yellowstone or something. They look cumbersome, but they're like a wildebeest. They can turn on a dime and come at you. Generally, as far as farming them, they are more, they're easier than cattle in some ways because we don't dehorn, we don't castrate, we don't help them calve. They've got to do it all their own. They are more difficult in the, to contain them, to bring them into the, into the- They like to roam. They like to roam. If you start bringing them into the corral, they get stressed and that's when they, they have this flight or fight mechanism in their brain. If they can get away from you, they will. If they think they can't, they'll come at you. So. Okay, you're not feeling that right now, are you? No. Gonna, okay. <laughs> no. no, but it's been it's been interesting. We have, uh, I think, 250 cows wow. now. I think it's probably the largest herd of bison east of Mississippi in America. I did not realize that. How, how do you like your bison burger? I like a medium rare. How do you Me like too. It? Medium rare. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we we have our own processing plant. So the bison burger, you get a proof. It's we know where it came from. We know how it was raised. We know how fresh it is. So it's about the best you can get straight off the farm. Absolutely delicious, no question. Good. You, you, you had mentioned that Craig Greenberg, our mayor, is is one of your best friends, maybe your best friend. Right. And to me, I'm excited about the direction Louisville's moving in. So you've obviously helped us in, in development and renovation of architecture with what you've done now, down there with 21C and other buildings that are close. So what, what's next for you? Do you and Craig have time? I, I mean, I think you two make a dynamic combination. He's very, very sharp guy. I know he was a partner in 21C. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about, if you all had talks about what may be happening moving forward? Well, let me just say that I think Craig is the most creative businessman I've ever met. I mean, he's well, an attorney. He started out as our attorney, but he thinks in a creative way more than other any other attorney that I've certainly ever worked with. So he thinks outside the box and he's He's looking, he, you know, he wants to have uh, pre-K for every child in the city. Um, and that's not an easy task, but that's his goal. 
<clears throat> he's thinking about uh, solar energy for the city. Um, and he's off on his, you know, I don't, I haven't seen Craig for about a month, so God knows what he's thinking today, but um, I'm sure it's going to, it's going to be good for all of us. Yes, I know he's presenting his economic business plan and he's refining that and you're right. He is creative, much like yourself and like yourself. He's very good at implementing and making sure that he reaches his goals. I love that. He's a get to it kind of guy yeah. and stays very focused. Okay. Um, I want to talk about maybe some of the issues this city has had, and we're, it's not unique to us. I mean, there's a lot of markets our size who, you know, we've had the protests. Of course, there was COVID, and it really did hurt the positive momentum downtown. I think we're making a comeback. I do too. But, but where people like you, like Craig Greenberg, of course, can help that. What, what would you say to the public as far as what they can do? I, I think they really need to see downtown because sometimes perception is not reality. It's not, I haven't found it to be unsafe. Right. No, of course not. I think the perception is the problem. And I, you know, the more we can do to get downtown, uh, why are you sitting in a subdivision building here? Why aren't you downtown? Yeah, no, that's a good, no, you know what? <laughs> that's a legit question. That is a good, you know, I, I think <clears throat> in my case, it's, you know, raising my sons, I've lived there for quite some time, but I do find it attractive because I see some of those studio apartments and beautiful buildings and I love the architecture and everything's available to you within a walk. I mean, you can talk about Norton Commons all you want, but it will never have the charm and the history of downtown. Right. I agree with you. But anyway, I'm trying to be No, I like you say that's, <laughs> that's a legit question, but all of a sudden the tables are turned here. I like uh, it. One of the problems we have now are pe people have changed their attitudes about work and they like being home during COVID. So we really need to get people back downtown to work. I think that's one of the keys. I think Craig has in mind some more festivals, some more mm -hmm. activities, maybe something uh, focusing on the river, which I think would be a really good idea. So I, it's going to take a while for to get past the perception, but I, I think Craig is the right guy to do it. I always like to say that Louisville is a great place to raise adults, and you've <laughs> helped that a lot, Steve. You really have. I mean, I, I do think you're a real asset to the city. Uh, one thing we haven't touched upon, and I, I think it's worthy of a, a conversation, definitely, is there's a lot to be said for chemistry. And we talked about the chemistry and combination of you and Craig Greenberg and leading this city and others, the team, as you said. But you and Laura Lee, I think it's it's perfect chemistry. It seems to me like she, you, she doesn't want to be the face guy. You like being up there in France. You're good at it. She's very smart, very classy. I think the combination of you two is fantastic. You, tell me your thoughts on that. Well, no, we are a great team, and uh, we've brought a lot to each other's lives. Uh, we've been married now 26 years. Give me, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the funny, uh, for some reason, this story came to mind. When we were dating, uh, we were living together, and people were talking about us, and I decided that if we're going to live together, I want to get married. And she had decided she'd never want to get married again. So um, we were on a trip in Pakistan, which few Americans have done for a long time. And we were, to, we were traveling on the Silk Route and we were to be on Camelback for three days in the Cholistan Desert. So I decided that was the perfect place to, <laughs> to propose. So <laughs> <laughs> There's Steve Wilson for you. <laughs> so I brought a ring with me. I, I was afraid to drop it in the sand, so I tied it into my handkerchief and I rode up on my camel and I gave it to her. And That's romantic. <laughs> no, it said, is romantic. It's a great story. So she says, what is this? And I said, well, what do you think it is? So she put it on, looked at it, then took it off. And I said to myself, said, what's going on here? So I rode up and she said, don't say a word. Don't pressure me. Don't say a word. So literally all day, took, put the ring on and took it off, on and off. And at the end of the day, we both had saddle sores from running back and forth on these camels. And she crawled into our little tent and she said, if you promise not to make me get back on that camel, <laughs> I'll marry you. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, that was the beginning of our of our married life, and we've enjoyed a lot of great travel together. As our collectors, we have cl friends who are collectors, and they have they have a rule about agreeing on everything they add to the collection. But Laurie and I don't do that, so something that grabs at my heart 
she doesn't really like it or something that she th loves and I don't. We, we give each other that latitude. And I think that's really what has built the collection as it is. It's, it's a wide variety of, the, of interesting material there. And uh, you know, I think of contemporary artists as historians of the time. All artists were contemporary in their time. So all these artists that we are collecting and get to know are just recording what's going on today. Interesting. I got a couple takeaways from that. Okay, first of all, you're a romantic. Yeah. I, I love I love yeah. what your perceptions of art and how you look at it and that you're very open to whatever anyone thinks and it should be timely. And also, don't ride a camel. Don't do not do that. <laughs> do not don't do ride that. a camel. Okay, no. before I let you go, this is going to sound very elementary, like a sixth grader is interviewing you. But I just wanted to get your answer on this one. If you could tell it, Louisvillians, people from around the country, anywhere in the state of Kentucky, you should see this piece of art, whether you have to travel or whether you can see it at 21C. What would you say? You should see this because maybe it evokes oh. different, different thoughts. Well, there's a young artist working in Paris that I'm really in taken with, and he's coming to Louisville on the 25th of January, I think. We're changing out the exhibition at 21C in January, and we're going to be featuring, featuring some of his work. He's, uh, he's quite a historian on American culture. So it, it, sort, of the, sort of the European idea of what America love and like. And there's a sculpture, a life-size bison sculpture that he created with a young man on its back holding a baby and the American flag over his shoulder. So it's a lot about the American dream and the perception of the American dream from the European attitude and is it attainable or is it not? And how we're dealing with that. Well, I, I can't wait to see that. That's, okay, that, sounds, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, a big thank you to Legato Financial Group for sponsoring Gaining Interest and a big thank you to Steve Wilson. And Steve, I mean this from my heart because I've thought this for a long time now. I get to say it to you face to face. You're a big asset to the city. I appreciate oh, all that you nice. and your team do. Thank you. All right. Once again, thank you for watching Gaining Interest. We'll see you next time.